Welcome back to Understanding Electricity. This is Video 4, Practical Application and Making Minor Repairs. This is the fourth and final video for this season. If you've watched the first three episodes, then you have a practical view of electricity under your belt. And with that comes the knowledge of how helpful it is, along with how dangerous it can be if not handled properly. Today we're going to apply that knowledge to addressing the common problem occurrences that one might encounter from what to do about a power outage, as well as what not to do, to backup power, transfer switches, and fault interruption devices. We'll cover replacement of faulty items from a practical and safe perspective. We'll be covering a lot of items today, and I'm going to try to move at a steady pace. Please feel free to stop the video at any time and resume when you're ready. To start, let's look at the common tools needed to address most problems. Here we have two different screwdrivers, a standard flat tip and a Phillips, along with a wire cutter, long nose pliers, and a wire gauge stripper. The other things you see are the electrical testing devices, and when it comes to those, there are a lot of them. The digital multimeter is a number one priority if you're going to make home repairs on the electrical system. It will test for both direct and alternating current, ohms, and amps. If you're going to work with electrical or electronics, you need one of these. This is a polarity tester, a handy device. You simply plug it in and it will identify if the hot wire, neutral, and ground wires are connected to the outlet properly. This is a non-contact electrical presence tester. The tip senses electrical flux. It lights and or buzzes when electricity is present. No physical contact is required. You only need to get near the outlet or the wire or the breaker. Regardless of the tool set you choose, they will be useful for making repairs. And last, there are two other items to have in your toolkit. Electrical tape, and wire nut connectors. The wire nuts allow wires to be spliced together. There are many different types of wire splicing connectors on the market. The most commonly used is the wire nut. Wire nuts are color coded for conductor size. It's important to use the proper nut for the number and size of conductors you need to splice together. For 14 gauge wire, the orange and yellow are the ones to use. Here is the proper way to use the wire nut in accordance with the manufacturer's directions. One. Strip from one half to three quarters of an inch of insulation from each wire. 2. Hold the wires side by side. Do not twist the ends together. 3. Place the nut and turn clockwise until the nut is screwed down, then continue twisting until the insulated wire wraps around themselves. This is the industry recommended method. Fourth, this is optional. I like to wrap the connector with electrical tape. I'm not sure if it actually helps, but I know it doesn't hurt, and it makes me feel like it's a better splice. If you are splicing a stranded copper wire and a solid copper wire together, the process is exactly the same as with the solid wires, with one modification. Extend the stranded wire 1 8 inch ahead of the solid. This will ensure a tight, solid splice. Now a note about aluminum wiring. While authorized for use, it must be approached with a different understanding of its properties and the things that can go wrong with it. Take note. There are wire connectors specifically for aluminum which have slightly different procedures for splicing. There is a specific requirement for connectors and anti-electrolysis coating for splicing aluminum and copper wires together. Don't ever splice those two together without that. If you don't, the wires will degrade within the splice, arc, and start a fire. In the previous video, we talked about the circuit breaker and what happens when there is a short in the circuit. Now it's time to talk about the other things that can occur. A short circuit is not the only type of fault condition. There is the possibility of a ground fault, and the possibility of an arc fault. All three are dangerous, and there are devices available to help protect you from that danger. In this short circuit example, the circuit breaker detects the heat created by the short and opens the circuit. This circuit breaker is called a thermal breaker and is the current standard. However, that is changing. More about that in a moment. A ground fault is different from a short, even though it looks similar. A ground fault happens when the electrons are not being returned to the neutral wire. They could be flowing to ground due to a wet condition, such as touching a hot wire and a water faucet at the same time. Doing so will bypass the neutral wire. A ground fault circuit interrupter, or GFCI, or GFI as they're known, measures the difference between what is sent out and what is returned. When an imbalance of a specified amount is detected, it opens the circuit. The purpose of the GFI is to prevent electrocution. An arc fault circuit interrupter, or AFCI, or AFI as it's called, is a device that monitors the circuit for electron arcing. An arc fault is any time the electrons find a path to ground by jumping through the air. This can happen due to a worn out insulation, a loose wire in the outlet, 
for when an appliance cord is inserted into the outlet with its switch in the on position, an arc happens as the potential and demand approach each other. The AFCI monitors for this condition, depending upon the draw and the length of time the arc occurs, will determine when the AFCI interrupts the circuit. The purpose of the AFCI is to prevent an arc fire. Each of these conditions is serious and can start a fire within the walls of the house, or in the outlet, or you could be electrocuted. To protect yourself, you need to have an AFCI GFI circuit protection. And before we go further, there is no difference between the terminology of AFCI and AFI. Same goes for the GFCI and GFI. They are both the same device being called by two different acronyms. Down at the hardware store, you may see both labels, but don't worry, they're the same device. Now that that's cleared up, it's a good time to mention the National Electric Code, which is where these standards are documented. Local electric codes vary, and these codes change all the time. In 2020, the National Electric Code was updated to require AFCI GFCI protection for all outlets that provide a 120 to 150 volt AC service, which means it covers every outlet in the house, regardless of the amperage involved. This is a big change. The previous 2017 NEC standard specified only 120 volts AC at 15 amp outlets in wet locations. However, the adoption of this new rule is up to local authority, which could be the state or county or city. When or if they adopt this new standard is up to them. And if they do, it will likely apply to new construction and perhaps major remodels of the home. Your existing home may be grandfathered in and not require an immediate change. However, before you celebrate dodging that requirement, take a look at this chart. Clearly, the more protection installed, the lower the electrocution rate. For your own protection and that of your family, if you have an older home without this protection in place, you should consider adding it. As shown here, the NEC provides two choices for AFCI and GFCI protection. One is to replace the individual outlet at the head of an outlet string with a new combination AFI-GFI outlet, as shown here. Or, you can replace the thermal breaker with an AFI-GFI breaker in the service panel. The good news is, either approach will work and satisfy the requirement. The bad news is, they can be expensive. And with the approach shown here, you need to locate that first outlet in the chain, which can take some time and effort to do. Eventually, all branch circuits in the house will require protection. Until that happens, here are four locations of immediate concern. These are the wet areas of the home, and they're most likely to present a ground fault or arc electrocution risk. The bathroom, the kitchen, the laundry room, and any outlet on the patio by the pool where the kids always want to plug in the radio. You don't want them to do that with their wet feet standing on the concrete. Same thing for the electrical clothes dryer. Bare feet, concrete floors, and electricity. Not a good combination. Here we have two outlets. The standard outlet is on the right and the GFI outlet on the left. The AFI and GFI outlets have the same physical features. As you can see, the interface connection for the plug is designed exactly the same on both outlets, a polarized interface. The two buttons located between the upper and lower plugs are the test and reset buttons. On some models, these buttons are different colors, as you see here. Pushing the test button creates a fault in the circuit. The reset button will pop out immediately. If it doesn't, the GFI is defective and should be replaced. To reset the outlet back to normal operation, push in the reset button. It should stay depressed and in place. If it won't under this test condition, the outlet is defective and should be replaced. Industry recommendations are to test these units monthly. A note here, if the reset button trips on its own and will not reset, then it's likely a fault has developed within the circuit. That condition must be checked out and not ignored. Contact an electrician to locate and repair the fault. Some people make a mistake in judgment when they encounter this problem. They swap a larger amperage outlet. While that may allow the unit to reset, it is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Never replace a properly sized outlet with a higher value one, such as from a 15 amp outlet to a 20 amp. Doing so will bypass the protection feature and could result in injury. Typically, AFCI and GFCI outlets have an LED indicator light that identifies its state. In this example, green indicates that everything is functioning normally. A no light condition indicates the GFI is in a fault or trip state or it has lost power. Red or orange is an indication that the GFI is failing and needs to be replaced. AFI and GFI outlets are not a replacement for the circuit breaker in the service panel. They work together to provide a range of protection. 
The circuit breaker provides thermal protection for the circuit between the service panel and the outlet. The GFI is protection between the outlet and you, and the AFCI is looking for a specific arc fault condition anywhere in the circuit. It is these three protections that can save your life. Each of the units shown here have electronic circuitry inside to perform the specific GFI and AFI task. Here is the wiring detail for the protection outlet. This applies to an AFCI or GFCI or a combination unit. The wiring is the same. This is a daisy chain wiring pattern. The first outlet in the chain is the protection device. The device receives its power from the service panel breaker. All other outlets in the chain receive their power from the protection unit. The wires from the service panel breaker are called the line. The wires going to the next outlet in the chain is called the load. Be sure to read the label in the back of the device to understand which screws are which on the device you are installing. It could be different from what you see here. The ground wires connect to the green screw on the device. It is spliced to the outgoing ground wire with a wire nut. This continues the ground connection to the next outlet. The incoming neutral connection will match up with the elongated plug slot on the left, the hot connection to the shorter one on the right. It will be the same for the outbound load wires. Alternately, protection for the entire branch circuit can be provided by installing an AFCI-GFCI breaker. There are many manufacturers of this device, and they range from 15-amp single-pole single-throw to 50-amp single-throw double-pole. On the left, we have a standard thermal breaker, and on the right, we have an AFCI-GFI breaker. The AFCI-GFCI breaker is easily distinguished from the standard breaker by a couple of outward features, the most noticeable being the coiled pigtail neutral wire. Both the standard breaker and the AFCI-GFI breaker snap into the breaker bus in the same fashion. Wiring, however, is different. With the standard breaker, black wire from the branch circuit connects to the single lug screw on the breaker. The white wire from the branch circuit connects to the neutral bus, and the ground wire goes to the ground bus. With the AFCI-GFCI breaker, both the black and white wires from the branch circuit terminate on the breaker. In this example, the black on the right, labeled load, and the white on the left, labeled neutral. The coiled pigtail white wire from the breaker is connected to the neutral bus in the service panel. And of course, the branch circuit ground wire connects to the ground bus. A slightly different wiring pattern than with a standard breaker. Here is the advantage of using an AFCI-GFCI breaker. All connections on the branch circuit, both outlets and switches, are protected from a common point in the service panel. There is no need to spend the time and effort to identify the first outlet in the chain and replace it with an AFCI-GFI unit. The entire branch circuit is addressed with one replacement.